So, the first step in carrying out genetic engineering is to isolate the desired gene from the genome of the gene donor. This can be hard, as less than 2% of DNA actually codes for protein, the rest is non-coding. We've got to find that specific part of a gene which is going to code for the polypeptide that we're interested in. We will look at two methods of doing this. Okay? One is to use restriction endonucleases along with gel electrophoresis and complementary gene probes. The other is the use of mRNA and reverse transcriptase. So, let's look at the first option there. Restriction endonucleases, now these are enzymes that are made by bacterial cells as a defense mechanism against viruses. They use them to cut up the virus's DNA into fragments. Now these enzymes can be very useful to humans if we can isolate them, because we can use these enzymes to target specific sequences of four to eight nucleotides long, which are called restriction sites, on a particular gene. So we can cut up the gene into pieces. Now they don't affect the bacteria themselves as either they don't have these specific sites on their DNA or they add methyl groups to adenines and cytosines within the target sites which is something called methylation. So the bacteria here have these special enzymes which they can use to destroy viral DNA but it doesn't damage the, the bacteria themselves. Now there are many different types of restriction endonucleases found in various species of bacteria and they each cut DNA at different restriction sites. They usually leave short overhangs of unpaired bases, which we call sticky ends. And now these join very easily to other complementary sticky ends. So it's a, a bit of, way of, of a nice way of sort of patching sections of DNA together. If you use the same endonucleases to isolate the desired gene and also to cut open the host genome, then hopefully they, so those sticky ends should be able to meet up and be complementary and it should be easy to sort of patch in the, the gene into the host's genome. However, if you cut the DNA you want with restriction endonuclease to get the desired gene, it will cut anywhere where the restriction site is. So you'll end up with multiple sections of DNA which we call restriction fragments. Now how do we work out which one of these actually is the gene that we want? How do we isolate that particular fragment? Well, we can use a technique to separate these fragments according to their length. It's called gel electrophoresis, and it will be explained in a lot more detail later in this presentation. When they are separated and the correct fragment is identified, then you can use something called complementary gene probes. Now, these probes are complementary to the sequence in that gene only, and so will only bind to that specific gene. The only problem is that a gene is double-stranded, and so it must first have its hydrogen bonds broken, so it needs to be denatured, then you can add the probe which will bind to the complementary area uh, of the gene. Once the probe has been added, then it can be identified and so that gene can be confirmed. Now, using restriction endonucleases is not always possible. First of all, you need a restriction site either side of the gene, which isn't always the case in order to sort of cut the gene and get the gene out. So the, the, the restriction sites might not be in the right place. Sometimes uh, they have these restriction sites, but they are so far away from the ends of the genes that the restriction fragment is just way too long. Therefore, one would need to use an alternative method. So let's go back to our two options again. Now, the second option was to use something called reverse transcriptase and mRNA. Now, the principle here is that in transcription, the DNA is turned into messenger RNA or is copied into messenger RNA uh, and that gene is, is transcribed and that messenger RNA goes and it forms a template for the polypeptide to be formed. Well, if we could find that mRNA and reverse the process, then we could actually make the DNA from the mRNA. So we can do sort of transcription backwards. Now, we have found an enzyme that does just that. It's called reverse transcriptase, and it is isolated from a retrovirus. Now, these viruses have an RNA genome, and so they use this enzyme to make a DNA copy of their genome, which is called a provirus, which then gets inserted into their host. It's very, very clever. So if we can find a cell where the gene is being actively expressed, where the, the, the cell is making the protein from the gene, then there should be lots and lots of messenger RNA coding for that particular gene. You take mature messenger RNA, 
which has been spliced to have the introns removed, and use reverse transcriptase to make the complementary DNA, and finally use some DNA polymerase to make it double-stranded. So we're basically working backwards from messenger RNA to a single strand of DNA to then a double strand of that to get the DNA gene. And the resulting gene copy is called cDNA. Now there are some advantages of using reverse transcriptase and messenger RNA over the other method we've already talked about. First of all, it's easy to get the complete gene from the DNA. Uh, secondly, it's available in greater quantities, the messenger RNA. Uh, and thirdly, prokaryotic cells cannot remove introns from a gene. Uh, in genetic engineering, you quite often use bacterial host cells. And so if you insert DNA, uh, the introns must be removed first, which is a really fiddly thing to be able to do. But if we're using mature messenger RNA and working backwards, the introns have already been removed. So that problem is, is no longer there. Okay, so now that we have the desired gene, we need to make sure we have enough of it. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, has many applications in gene technology. For example, cloning of gene fragments to analyze genetic diseases, identification of contaminant foreign DNA in a sample, uh, and amplification of DNA for sequencing. So this is a type of reaction that you can do to multiply a sample. Quite often when you get DNA, it's only in a small sample, but this polymerase chain reaction rapidly produces large quantities of it, lots and lots and lots of copies of that DNA. Now it's got three steps, and you're gonna need a particular apparatus. You need something called a thermal cycler, you need some primers, you need some free DNA nucleotides, and you need DNA polymerase. So step one, is to separate the DNA strands. So what's happened is the sample is heated up to 95 degrees C. Now that's to break all those hydrogen bonds because although individual hydrogen bonds are quite weak, you've got to separate a lot of hydrogen bonds here. So the, the combined energy you need to do that is a lot. Now that's done in the thermal cycler and exposes all the bases. Then the second stage is something called annealing. Now what happens is the mixture is cooled to 65 degrees C and primers are added to the start of the target genes. Specific primers are added and those go at the beginning of the target genes. Then it gets heated up to 72 degrees C, which is kind of a optimum temperature. It's not too high um, where denaturation can happen, but it's not also too low where the reaction would be too slow. And DNA polymerase replicates the DNA using complementary base pairing. Okay, this process is called elongation. So we've got separation, annealing, and then elongation. And this cycle is repeated many, many, many times until there are thousands of copies. Um, so for example, if you had a crime scene situation and, and you found a very, very small sample of the DNA, you can then get thousands of copies on it before you do your analysis. Now, the DNA polymerase used is a very special type of DNA polymerase. You may have thought, well, 72 degrees C doesn't sound like an optimum temperature for a normal enzyme, but that's because this is something called TAC polymerase, and it comes from a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus, which lives in hot springs and hydrothermal vents, so it has evolved a DNA polymerase enzyme that can withstand very high temperatures, what we call a thermostable uh, enzyme. Okay, so now that we've got the desired gene, and we've now copied it, so we've got lots and lots of it, we've got it in a high quantity, we now need to try and insert it into a host cell.